Okay, so let's go ahead and get started to just cover, you know, recap what we're going to cover today for the recording purposes. <laughs> we will be talking, we're starting with volunteers. Uh, we're going to start with adding volunteers, updating volunteer information, and searching for volunteers. From there, we're going to go into configurations. And mostly that's just going to be a presentation of where the configurations are and kind of a brief kind of orientation of, of which ones you'll need to be concerned with starting off and as well as some definitions. From there, we will then go into creating um, opportunities, which will include the topic of um, application forms. So we will talk a little bit about application forms, how to create them. As a side effect, we will touch a little bit on orientations and trainings, not too much there. And we will end the day with having created some uh, uh, opportunities. We'll talk about both basic and advanced. So let's go ahead and get started. So I guess actually the first topic to cover is just a little bit of navigation. So when you come into your system, you'll start on your dashboard. Um, I'm currently logged into your system. We'll go ahead and stay in your system for the time being until we actually need to start uh, playing with test data. Then we're going to switch over to my demo system. We have three menus. I can say four menus at this point that we will uh, want to be aware of. The first one is what we call the quick menu. We have the communications inbox, it's kind of a menu. We won't be talking about it today, but be aware of it. We have the account menu. This is a very important menu. And we have the main menu, which is where we do most of our operations today. So with the quick menu, we have a couple of functions that we want to be aware of. We have the quick search for volunteers, where you can put in a name and get a record. We have advanced search. We'll play with that a little bit in just a few minutes. We have quick add, as we call it, where we can add volunteers, add opportunities, add hours for a volunteer, or even add an organization, which we'll cover in the next training. We have recently visited volunteers, so volunteer that we've, or, or a, um, or a um, team that we've recently visited that we want to see again, we'll find here. Recently visited organizations, and then just generally recently visited pages, so like dashboards, and um, search results and things like that. And close. There we go. In the account menu, there's two particular options that we want to be aware of. One of them we don't actually see because I come in from a, a special account type that doesn't have it. But the first is the My Account link. This is where you can update your uh, organization's information, credit card, stuff like that, create new users. The other one here, we can use my demo system for that, is a support link. This will take you to our tutorial website where you can find written in some video tutorials and other uh, useful resources on how to use the system. These resources are also available to your partners um, when the time comes. We also have a rather hefty set of user guides being developed right now um, that should be available in the coming months. So putting that out there. And then the main menu, which we kind of talked about. All right, so let's go ahead and do a search. So that's you know a pretty common thing that you want to do with your volunteers. And so when we want to search for a volunteer that's already existent, we'll talk about adding in a moment, we can use the quick search. So I could just type in Bob, there's always a Bob, and hit enter. It's going to search the system, so we can see the system thinking, there we go. And it will load up the search results for everybody with Bob in their first or last name. If I'd done like Bob Smith, we would have gotten just Bob Smith. Um, so Alexandra Bobo, and Bob Cox, for example, both have Bobs in their name. From here, I can click on the name of a volunteer and look at their record. I can edit them. I can reset password and a couple other options. I can also do some bulk actions where I can select them and uh, take those bulk actions. Most of them are communication oriented, which we'll be covering in the second training. If I wanna do something a bit more specific in my search, I can go to advanced search And this is where I could say, well, that Bob has to be a first name, for example. Or I could look for people in a certain city. Or I could use these other criteria set, this other criteria section and look for things like custom data set information, uh, address information, skills, things like that. So if I wanted to see everybody who has an address, this is actually a pretty common one, I could go address line one, and as my operator do, is not empty, and search. And this would show me every volunteer who has an address. We don't care what it is, but they have something in their address line one field. So we'll see that result, whatever that's going to be. 
and it looks like we have whew, uh, <laughs> a lot, almost uh, approaching 25,000 volunteers we actually have an address for, or at least address line one for. Um, although it looks like some of these could use a little tidying up. So any <laughs> questions about searching for volunteers before we add one? No, on the agency side, they yeah. only can search for volunteers that are associated with their agency, correct? Correct. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. So you see everything that passes through you, and they see only what's been passed to them. That means, though, if a volunteer is added manually by the organization, it doesn't pass through you, thus you never know about the volunteer. So do keep that in mind. Okay. For example, if they have added it manually or if they pay for a premium account and have their own public portal in addition to yours, then if the volunteer came in through their public portal, that bypasses you and you wouldn't know about the volunteer. So keep that in mind. So let's go ahead and add a volunteer. Uh, for this, I will switch to my demo system since I don't want to add a bad vol fake volunteer to your system. So we'll switch over to my uh, smaller, <laughs> much smaller uh, database. And an easy way to add a volunteer, quick add volunteer. And this will bring up the add edit screen for volunteer. The edit screen is basically the add screen, but a little different. We'll see the difference in just a minute. And we can go ahead and put in all the details for our volunteer. So we can put in Terry... Bruce, as our example, by the way, Terry, you may have noticed her in the, in the meeting, is actually, um, I forgot to mention, she's sitting in for training purposes. She may be helping you in the future. She's new with our organization. Um, forgot to mention that earlier. My apologies. Um, so she's going to be our dummy example today, Terry Bruce. And we fill in her information. And, um, you know, one thing we probably want, if we have it available, is we will want to enter her email. This way, if... You know, we need to communicate with this volunteer, we can do so. One of the secondary, almost primary, benefits of getting that email, in addition to communicating with them, is if we're adding them manually, we can send them a setup, a setup link so that they can create their volunteer account by us adding them in manually. So this is a cool feature, because um, in the end, we want our volunteers to create accounts so that they can manage their information, update their profiles, apply online, and by sending this link, it helps get them one step closer by giving them that account. So if the, if the agency is populating this by adding a volunteer and they check that box, then does that volunteer then go into our system? You had said a manual ad doesn't populate. That would still count. As, uh, it would still be a manual ad. It would bypass you, correct? So, so they'll still have an account. If they will have an account. Yeah. But that said, when the volunteer eventually goes to your public portal and applies for something, then you'll capture them. Gotcha. So you will get them, you know, assuming they're a free agency, eventually that volunteer is going to have to come through you to apply for something that theoretically has to. They, they could continue to always be mm -hmm. manual. Um, theoretically speaking, they will eventually pass through your portal and you will capture them and know about them. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to go ahead and fill out all these fields. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Ooh. Apparently in this, my demo system, I did make this required. Um, I need to change that valley house drive. So let me put in some fake 94928. Congratulations to Terry, you live in California now. Um, okay. So in my demo system, I made these required, but you don't have to um, save. And the record will be saved. And we'll get the edit screen for the record once it is saved. So... There we go. When, if you edit a record, as you notice, it's a little different, not too dissimilar. Uh, we just have a couple of extra tabs. For one thing, we now have a unique PIN number that's been assigned to the volunteer. We can use this to uniquely identify them. We can see what programs they're associated with, any custom fields they filled out, emergency contact info, social media info. Uh, it doesn't do too much right now, but it's good for reference purposes, and any documents you've put on their file. And if we want to, we can view the volunteer and get a summary page with their details. So this is actually the same page you would get when you go to recently visited volunteers. And here we'll see their trainings, opportunities, email, communication history, and all that other fun stuff. So any questions so far about, van about, about managing the volunteers themselves, searching and adding? 
So if someone comes to the system and mm -hmm. signs in through Facebook, mm -hmm. it populates first name, last name, and email. Mm -hmm. So if we have other required fields, then at that point, are they then required to fill in the required field? They are not. Um, those fields are usually attached to an application form, and so what you would you'd capture those when they actually apply for something. When they actually register, we kept it very simple. Um, no, actually, you're right. If there is required, it would capture them during the account creation process. So, so the, for, the, it would, it would auto populate them. on whatever came from Facebook, but they'd have to provide yeah. additional information. Correct. Requested. Yeah. So, so okay. they'll. Um, They'll log in using their Facebook, but they'll still go through more or less the regular registration process for their account, and we'll have to fill in um, any information that you made required during the registration process. Um, okay. Though personally, since they could theoretically create their account via the, um, you know, our main page, funnelyconnect.com, or they could theoretically come in through a partner, a great way to make sure that you absolutely have that information is put it on application forms. Um, and that's you know, you can, you can catch them then too. So if you didn't get it in that first round, there is other ways to capture it. Okay. So, okay. all right. So any questions? So I'll pause again. Any questions, any, anything else for volunteers before we move into configurations? Yep. All right, cool. Okay, so at this point, we're heading into the process flow to start being able to create opportunities. Um, some organizations call them projects, we call them opportunities. It's basically what volunteers apply for. And to do that, we need a couple of pieces. We will need to check out some configurations, and we will probably need to look at orientations and trainings, perhaps, which we'll just kind of skim that, and designing application forms, which we'll spend some time on. So what we're going to need to do is look at our configurations. You will have also wanted to do the design my public site. I usually do that in the second training if we have time or if there's interest. Um, so just putting that out there. So here on configurations, we have the various things we can configure. About half of these are search tags. So we won't cover them right now by defining them, but I will point out what, which ones are search tags. Um, and those are the activity types, causes, age groups required, population served, age group served, and skills. So those ones, we're not going to define them right now. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. Just go in there, add the item, click add. Um, nothing too fancy on that. Uh, but there are a couple items on here that we do want to define. Specifically programs, agreements, and custom data sets. Now these ones we'll go into. I do want to make sure you are aware of the um, uh, notification settings. Oh, excuse me, email notifications. That's the one I want. And these are all the various emails that are sent by the system either to you or to the volunteer. I recommend that you peruse through them, update the content, put in any verbiage that you might want to. Most of them are pretty straightforward, um, and we'll let you know who they go to, but if you have any questions, let me know. But I do recommend that you review these at some point. Uh, there's also the volunteer sign-up. This is where we can dictate what, you know, is what a volunteer will be going through uh, in terms of signing up. So this is where we can do, like, you know, make the address required, which currently is uh, active on my system. Actually, let me switch back to your demo system so we can actually look at your configurations. The actual ones in yours. I forgot that I didn't switch over. So, all right. So let's talk about programs, agreements, and custom data sets. Let's start with programs. This is an important concept. Um, it actually is the same. The concept is shared with our CRM system. So um, what programs are is they're basically your major initiatives. They're part of sometimes part of your mission statement. Um, they are the major things that your opportunities are supporting. From the CRM perspective, which you may not be, I don't think, I don't know if you guys have that. Um, it we also could not. represent, you do? Okay, cool. We do not. Oh, do not. Okay, well, just as to help kind of frame it in the bigger picture, um, in terms of like our CRM, it represents things that people might donate to. So if that kind of gives you a, a sense of kind of what a right. program is. So in terms of volunteer, it's what your volunteers are supporting, you know, the bigger pictures. Um, so for like an arts organization, it might be things like, you know, exhibitions and uh, events and classes and community outreach or things like that. For you, you know, we have Family Matters, Day of Change, um, Visit for St. Nicholas, and so forth. Second organization that's had that. Interesting. Um, 
yeah, there's another organization. I forget. Jackson, Jacksonville. Jacksonville. Okay, yeah, that's mm -hmm. who it was. So, okay. So these are examples of uh, you know, programs I've seen before. Some of these may actually be more what should have been considered um, actual individual opportunities. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, they're no. not. Yeah, not so that we currently do. So gotcha. So we can ignore most of these are inactive, so we don't need to worry too much about them. But do programs make sense as a concept? Sure. Yeah. Excuse yeah, okay, cool, cool. All righty, so creating a program is pretty, pretty easy. Just add new program, put in the details. We have a little configuration over here and the description. This will be shown online as long as it's displayed on public site. And what this means is on your public site, you'll have a programs option, a, a menu option. If someone clicks on that, they'll see all your programs, the details for those programs, and the opportunities linked to those programs. So the visit for St. Nick, if you had different opportunities for, they could learn about the St. Nick program and the opportunities of, that are associated to it and apply for one of them or multiple of them. So it's a good way to kind of organize things online and kind of give people the bigger picture. All right. So that's programs. We got that done. Um, we're going to go ahead and use the left-hand menu here, a bit of navigation help. And now we're going to look at agreements. Where there? There it is, agreements. So agreements are kind of exactly what you think you might think they are. They are agreements, waivers, things that a volunteer or organization may have to agree to at some point in their relationship with you. So we could, for example, have a liability waiver that volunteers must fill out, basically electronically sign, that we can attach to application forms. So we give the agreement title. Is it, for, or is it used during the registration process? and um, you know, who, basically who does it apply to, and the details. We can also upload a document. And then if we add this to the form, they will have to electronically sign it, basically just typing their name saying, I agree. So um, not every organization uses this, but I've seen this used for everything from liability waivers to media release um, and everything in between. So any questions about agreements? Nope. All right. Mm -hmm. We're plugging along very nicely. And the last thing, and this is a really important one, is custom data sets. So you saw on a volunteer's record, we track a variety of fields. First name, last name, email, phone number, address, and all that fun stuff. Um, <clears throat> there might be information, however, that you want to track that we don't. Custom data sets let you do that. So if I needed you know, additional volunteer information, I could create a data set, call it something like additional volunteer information. I'm actually going to edit this volunteer information one that you already have and see what's in there. And we could add fields to that data set. So right now you have a bunch of you know various questions, education level, employer, employment status, a lot of demographics really, um, mm -hmm. that are part of this volunteer information custom data set. And so basically you've now extended the system in such a way that volunteers will have this in their record. If I actually click the opportunity button as well, which I think I'm going to do in save because I think that's what you want, uh, you would then also be able to attach this to application forms and have them fill this out as the uh, part of the application process. So um, custom data sets, containers, groupings of questions that you may want to ask a volunteer. When we create a field, field name, field type, so we got a lot of options. Is it required? Is it staff use only? This means that even if you put this whole data set on a application form, the volunteer will not see any fields marked staff use only, but you will on the back end. So this could be things for, uh, let's see, do we have any examples here? Um, date minor, re minor waiver received, for example, would probably be an example of staff use only because the volunteer doesn't fill this out, you do. I mean, right. uh, you know, because the volunteer isn't the one receiving it, you're receiving it. So you could make this staff use only, which let's go ahead and do that. Sorry, it was a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so now it means that the volunteer won't see that field. You will. Would court ordered volunteer be the same thing? I get, yeah. I mean, I was just looking, thinking we'd probably remove some of, we would probably uncheck okay. opportunity because doesn't necessarily populate, but some of it will. Well, see, this know? is we're not going to go on every application form. It simply means we have the option to use it. 
Oh, that's okay. all this means okay. is we have the option to use it, which is why I checked it because okay. I figured this looked like the kind of data set that you'd want the option to use. Gotcha. Okay. And we'll go ahead and, if we don't mm -hmm. have, we'll, if we'll go ahead and build one today, you know, we can put together a basic opportunity application form for you today as part of the training. Okay. So, okay. So let's, we'll leave this here. I recommend going through this, seeing what you want to keep and what you don't. Um, any questions about custom data sets? Not yet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, so that's that's configurations for the time being. Most of them, like I said, are the the uh, search tags and then programs, agreements, and custom data sets are of particular interest, as well as email notifications and volunteer sign up as something you'll probably want to review at least once. So from here, uh, I'm just going to kind of skim the concept of orientations and trainings. As part of the or opportunity creation process, we can indicate that a volunteer must attend an orientation and or training. I meaning they have to come to some, you know, meeting of ours and go through some sort of orientation or training process. And so what we can do is we can create those orientations and trainings here, these all older ones. We could add a new training and we give it a name and do we let them cancel and where is it going to be? and the details and under scheduling and we're not going to cover the scheduling here we'll cover it when we get to opportunities um, we can say you know what days of the week this is and what time the various sessions are and then later on we can say that a volunteer you know has to go to one of these sessions to, in order to become a volunteer for the, some given opportunity and then we can indicate that they went or didn't go and the system will know that and either will let them proceed if they've gone and it's required or keep waiting for them to actually go to the orientation. So, kind of more of an overview of orientations and trainings, but any questions on those? Nope. Okay, cool. No. Alrighty, so with that set aside, let's talk about application forms. These are pretty simple to make. You can have as many as you want. You can have the same application form attached to multiple different opportunities, although one opportunity can only have one form. So keep that in mind. So currently we don't have any forms say that, in your say that, system. Hmm? Eric, say that again. One, one opportunity can only have one form is that you just said? Correct. Okay. But a given application form might be used for several different opportunities. Correct. So it's okay. there's it's a one to one ratio one it's a one to many relationship in giving depending on which way you go. <laughs> Look at it. Um, so add new form. And we'll go ahead and build a general one for today as an example. And we could just call this the general, ooh, helps I could spell, general form. And it's pretty easy to add fields. Add field, name, add field, say um, emergency contact info, add field, email, and add field, say birth date. Now I consider this a pretty good basic form. I can move things around, so let's move email up. Theoretically, we will already have this information, uh, so the system will simply fill in what they already knows. If they've previously right. filled out the form, the system, as mentioned, will already know, and they just have to confirm it's true. Um, we hmm. don't necessarily always get these fields, but I kind of think that it's a good practice to put these on application forms so that you know people's ages, and if something goes wrong, we have to be prepared for these things. We know who to contact. And, and let me ask you, so if if this information is ever um, entered by the volunteer in the system for some opportunity, mm -hmm. does then it automatically sort of save that? So if yes. they went to XYZ agency next time and they had a form, it would pre-populate with whatever they had entered in, in any form on the system? Uh, I'm not 100% sure on emergency contact, but I, I, I'm, I want to say yes on all of that, with one exception, custom data sets, because they aren't shared between organizations. Gotcha. But any sort of basic... Any of the basic fields, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those should be, those should be pre-populated and shared, correct. Okay. So, and if we want to add a custom field, custom data set, and here's the one that we set for being available for opportunities and we just add it in. And yeah. so this would be all your additional information. So I won't add this at this time since you were talking about reviewing it, but 
I'll go ahead and save this, this form as it is right now as an example. Okay. So at this point, you do have a basic application form that you can use. Mm -hmm. so, any questions? Not yet. No. All right. <laughs> so we're getting into the last half of our training, the second half. Depends on how you look at it. Let's be positive. The second half, um, where we actually get to create opportunities. So to create opportunities, we go to our opportunities. And we'll see all the opportunities we currently have. At this point, I will be switching now to my demo system. Because, um, you know, we're going to play with some fake data and we're going to do a couple things and we don't want to leave bad data in your system. But I do see here that you have AB Hill Elementary Delivery and Discovery Day as an opportunity. It's going for a rather extended time period. We'll talk about that. It has 18 volunteers currently published. It is advanced, so it's using more, more fun scheduling. It is linked to the Share the Spirit of the Giving of Giving 28, 20, 2008 program, which is currently disabled. And uh, oh you have one active, 203 inactive opportunities, and we can edit and do a couple other fun things. So let's switch to my demo system and let's do some of those fun things. So we're going to go to my opportunities. I've got a number of opportunities already created, so we will just do some editing there to look at what we have. But let's talk a little bit about, about first what an opportunity is. <clears throat> no, I only have one opportunity, so I guess we're going to get to make one. Um, basically, what an opportunity is, is a job posting. It's kind of a loose analogy. It's basically what will the volunteer be being applying for. It's, you know, what, the, what you need volunteers for. It can be kind of broken down with different locations, uh, different schedules and shifts, and different jobs within the posi within the opportunity. We we'll call them positions. So uh, my EKS here, which is earn it, keep it, save it, uh, United, it's a United Way thing, um, would have thing. It's a tax help program. Uh, would have positions like you know, tax helper, um, site coordinator, vol uh, uh, translator, um, and uh, greeter, for example. If you're doing an event, like a one-time event as an opportunity, you may have positions like um, front gate uh, ticket seller, um, grounds setup, takedown, cleanup, and so on and so forth. So we can make an opportunity that's very specific, one day, one schedule, one job, or it can be very broad, multiple locations, different scheduling for those locations, and different jobs. But let's right. start with a simple one. So we have two kinds of opportunities. We have basic and we have advanced. Basic is, you know, kind of that one example, kind of one day, one thing, one job, one location. Advanced is where we deal with more complex, where you may have multiple locations and so on. So let's start with the basic. And actually, we're going to cover in this basic, we're going to cover most of the concepts we need for creating an opportunity. Advanced, the main piece is scheduling. And so when we do it advanced, we'll focus on the scheduling piece. So let's add a basic opportunity. Um, let's see. We need an example. Opportunity. Uh, anybody got an example? Like a basic opportunity they may know coming up? Otherwise, I'll make one up. But sometimes I like going with the real thing. No? That's OK. So let's do as an example. We're having a, um, a job fair. You know, your organization is putting on a job fair with, you know, where local nonprofits can come and say what jobs openings they have. Then people can come and maybe find a job. Never actually seen that happen, but it sounds like a good idea. So let's run with it. So um, I don't know. It sounds cool. I, I'd like it. Um, it would make some sense to me. So that is what our organization will be putting on. And we need people to help us with this. So our opportunity might be the nonprofit 2016 job fair. Since you are a volunteer action center, you might be making this opportunity on behalf of another one of your partners. So, right. you know, little tiny one person nonprofit might say, hey, can you put this up for me? I, I don't have the bandwidth to do it and I really need help. And you might, you know, say, okay, we do that. And so you could do, I'm creating this on behalf of that agency. So that is an option. Um, not every organization does that, but you have the option to do it. So that's on behalf of opportunity name, 
I usually recommend uh, your opportunities be for, finite, for, for finite periods. So uh, this opportunity, I wouldn't just do nonprofit job fair. I'd actually specify that it was for 2016. It's going to make reporting a lot easier and for more advanced opportunities, but we'll see why it could be a big deal. Um, so naming nomenclature can be important. Opportunity owner, what user is responsible for this? If I was assigning this, if I was doing this on behalf of one of my agencies, I could assign it to one of their people. But at the time being, it's just me because I'm the only user on this account. Is it a virtual opportunity? So if, so not so much a job fair, but data entry. You just need a data entry volunteer. That is a virtual opportunity. There is no location, meaning they do it at home. Otherwise, we have the location. It's going to be defaulting to default, which is your office. Whatever you put in your account information, I can change this. And I could put, um, you know, some other location, which I don't know the address for any parks near us, but let's pretend if there's, you know, this was actually a park, you know, maybe having the job fair there. And just put in the details, shows a map, it's quite lovely. The map will even be available online. We then have opportunity details. This is basically the sales pitch for the opportunity, the job description. So what's the job fair? Why do we need volunteers? What may a job, what volunteers will be expected to do? And all those uh, important details that we want to put up online to help us try and draw them in. The program, if we have a program it is attached to, so we don't currently have one that would be applicable. The positions, now for basic opportunities, usually you just run with the default volunteer position. Advanced opportunities is where you start usually breaking up your opportunity into different jobs. So that's where if we wanted to do our job fair as an advanced opportunity, we could you know, think about having different jobs at the job fair, you know, greeters, uh, uh, kind of direct people around, um, set up takedown crew, things like that. Gotcha. Otherwise, we'll just stick with you know, the default position. And then we have the scheduling piece. Now in advanced opportunities, this is actually a third, this is step three and quite more uh, advanced. I don't want to use the word complicated, but it's not that bad. Uh, with a basic opportunity, we only just have these two options of one time, which is what we'll use here, and ongoing, which basically says that from this date to this date, we have an opportunity. And the person will be doing things in some time period, which is the shift. When we go to advanced, we can get more specific. So we'll see that in a little bit. So for something like a job fair, you know, it's on some date, Let's say it's um, next month on the 25th, so a month from now. We have a shift, which is basically when do we need the volunteers to show up. So let's give it a proper name, so all day. And we need volunteers to show up at you know 10 a.m. And they will need to be here until, say, I don't know, 4 p.m. Or if volunteers kind of come and go as needed, which you sometimes will see, obviously, with things like virtual or ongoing, the time could be flexible. Gotcha. So, any questions so far on this page for basic opportunities? Nope. Groovy. Mm -hmm. Let's move along. Save and next. So now we come to the requirements page. This is the beefiest of all the pages for both basic and advanced. And this page is actually the same for both basic and advanced. This is where we handle our search tags and a variety of settings for the opportunity. So this is actually where the bulk of the nitty gritty will be done, um, putting aside scheduling for advanced. So let's start with this top section, search tags, and then we'll get into the more settings oriented stuff. And while we're talking about search tags, let's give them definitions. So these search tags will help the volunteer find your opportunity. You as mentioned earlier, you can configure your options for these search tags. And let's now define them, causes, this is the big picture. What is the big picture that this opportunity will help address? So for example, since we're working with nonprofits, maybe civics and community is the big picture or part of the big picture. For this one, it might, you know, might be a little harder because you know it's a bunch of nonprofits, but I'd probably go with civics and community. Um, you can select multiple, but this is required that you select at least one. At least it was, well, it still is, that is. Okay. Um, next, we have activity type. This is what will you be doing in support of the bigger picture. So this would be things like um, 
event organizing or you know something like that. Um, let's see, do I have anything that would make let's do event organizing? So you're helping organize the event. Sure, you might make your own ones under configurations that match a little better. So now that we know what we're doing to support the bigger picture, what skills might a person need to have? So this is where you know you might start doing things like um, event coordination, stuff like that. You can make your own skills. I don't think I have any. I always use examples where I don't have a good skill set to pull from, um, but it's up to you. These are not required, but civics the causes is. So um, bigger picture being addressed by the opportunity. What you're going to do to ad help address that pic bigger picture? What skills are we going to be looking for for how volunteers to have? From here, who's going to get benefited by this opportunity? For something like a nonprofit job fair, you probably wouldn't use any of these. But if you were, say, a women's shelter, for example, you would, um, you know, you probably set a couple of these. So the age group of the women, so all ages perhaps, and the population exactly. might be homeless, yeah. you know, homeless women, uh, and gender female, or a men's shelter, vice versa. Um, I like using that example because it covers all three. So you may not use any of these, you may not use all three, it's up to you. And the last point, lastly, of all the search tags, I consider this the most important, and I'll explain why, but this is the age of the volunteer. So for a job fair, I might be a good with teens, adults, and seniors, but children under 13 would just get underfoot. Um, as opposed to maybe a beach cleanup, where children under 13 would be fully appropriate. You know, as long as they can be safe about picking up trash, they're good to go. So I consider this the most important search tag because for a while, uh, until we change things a little bit, I used to get a lot of phone calls from volunteers, or more accurately, from, vol from the parents of prospective teen volunteers. And so they'd call me up and say, hey, I'm looking for an opportunity for my 13-year-old daughter to go and help on something. And I was like, well, I'm tech support. I, I don't know of any offhand. But if you go to the website, there is this search field, and you can search by age. And sometimes I'd stay on the line with them to do it, and they'd find, like, I can't find anything, or they'd find opportunities that were totally not appropriate for teenagers. So what I found was people either weren't using the tag or using it inappropriately. And it came up so often, I considered it such an, that to be a very important tag, because it is, you know, it comes up a lot. So that's why I kind of spend this extra three minutes talking about the age of the volunteer. Gotcha. So I would recommend encouraging this search tag, if none other, for your volunteers. Okay. Any questions about the search tag before we move into the configuration kind of setup options? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this one is kind of half search tag, half setup. It's whether or not you allow teams for the opportunity. So for an opportunity, like a job fair, I would probably allow teams. So for example, you know, AT&T over here might create a team that represents 10 people and the team signs up and they basically pledge 10 people by being a 10 people of team of 10 and I allow them to sign up for the opportunity. So for a job fair, yeah, 10, just 10 people, fine by that. As opposed to something like an internship opportunity. Having, group, having a team doesn't make any sense. You're going to be vetting each person individually. So you wouldn't then have teams. So whether or not you allow them, mark that here. If you need to know who the team members are, then this option. For something like a job fair, you may, you may not. Uh, for something like having people come to a school and be yard duty or just kind of be kind of keeping an eye on things, you know, for playgrounds, definitely need to know who the people are because there's all sorts of requirements about uh, vetting people in terms of when it comes to kids. So and that actually might be an example where you wouldn't do teams, but that's just an example that comes to mind. Um, so that's teams. From here, we have application forms. So this is where we can say, what application form would we use? If we need to make a new one, we can go ahead and do that. So I'm not going to bother with an application form at this time. Actually, let's go with that one. Why not? So select your application form. There is, so putting aside, oh, yeah, let's do it now. Um, there is a feature called do I not have it on this account? I don't have it on this account. You, I can see it from your account, uh, even if you don't have it. There is a feature called Time It. 
Yep. This is a cool feature. You may actually have it on your account. I see everything, even if it's not turned on, so I'm not sure if you actually have it or not, but you may. And what it is is a punch-in, punch-out feature. It's really cool. It lets a volunteer go to a page that you've logged into um, that you maybe have on a tablet or on a laptop at the site, and they punch in their PIN number, which we saw earlier, and they punch in, and then when they're done, they punch out, and the system will log the hours for them. It's really handy. What this setting does is says, says they don't need to log out. So what will happen is they will um, punch in, and the system will automatically punch them out, depending on what we set here. So either when um, a set amount of time has passed, two, three, four, five, whatever hours, when the shift that they are assigned to ends, so if their shift normally is, is default, is configured to end at 4 o'clock, they punch out at four, or when their individual time is scheduled, which is probably what you'd want to do. So if the schedule is the shift is normally four o'clock, but they're only scheduled to three, this would punch them out at three, which is probably what you want. Gotcha. Um, and so that ties in, e mm -hmm. Each individual agency has to have that feature. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this would just be for your opportunities. Gotcha. There's also another feature called the attendance feature. We're going to see that on the next training. This is going to determine whether or not all hours are automatically logged. Let's not worry too much about that right now. It will make more sense on the next training. Okay. Generally speaking, leave it on. It is an awesome feature, and you probably want to keep it on. Okay, so our form is configured. So let's talk about the various settings over here. So we're going to give two scenarios. One is when every setting is off. And the other is when every setting is on. And then as we'll, and then we can deduce from that that we can do this stuff in between. So if we turn every setting here off, how the application flow for a volunteer works is they come to your public portal, they hit the apply button, they don't fill out any form, they're automatically considered a volunteer, at which point you, as an admin, can go in and log and uh, schedule them saying when they're going to actually be a volunteer. And as time goes on, you as an admin would go in and have to log their hours. So that's with everything off. Gotcha. On the flip side, with everything on, the volunteer will go to your public portal, find the opportunity, hit apply, fill out the form. You will get a notice saying there is a volunteer pending approval. You will go to a list, and we'll see that in the next training that shows the volunteer, you will get to review their application and either reject it or accept it. Assuming you accept it, they will then um, <clears throat> be considered a volunteer on the opportunity and they will be required to go to an orientation or training. They will then go to the orientation or training. You will mark that they've been attended and that they've now attended that orientation training. They will then be able to schedule their own hours or, or you can still schedule them yourself and once they start doing their hours, they will have the ability to log the hours for you, as well as you being able to log them for you. So those are the two extremes, and we can do every combination therein in between it. So we can have a, we can have application forms without orientations and vice versa. And that's basically what all these settings will do. Do Are they allowed, let's do it in the right order, um, do they have a form? Do we have to vet their application? Do they have to go to an orientation? Are they allowed to schedule themselves? And can they log their own hours? There's another option here we'll talk about in just a second. So do those various options make sense? Yeah, so when it says they can schedule for this opportunity, it just means basically they can sign up for whatever that particular one is, and it's odd they automatically are able to. Yeah, yeah. So schedule. if you had an opportunity that had, like, you can either work Monday or Tuesday, they get to choose, gotcha. as opposed okay. to having you oh, go in okay. and say they're working Monday or Tuesday or both. They could say both. Um, okay. So there. So any more questions on those pieces before we talk about background checks? Mm -hmm. well, no, I do have a question on the display on the public calendar. What's the advantage of not displaying on the public calendar? Okay. Or why is that? That even not is a very good question. So let's actually look at your public site for just a moment. So when you publish an opportunity, which we'll see at the last step, it will be added to your online page, and you can search for it, and it comes up in search results 
that's just what it does. There is also this calendar. And what that lets you do is see kind of visually opportunities, you know, this week or this month or stuff coming up. So it gives a visual representation of orient of opportunities. You can search for it as well. It's just another way to look at it. That said, it can get very, very cluttered. So if I've got 100 opportunities, um, which we have an example here, it's very full. If I've got a lot of all opportunities right. and they're all on the public site, it's very, very full. So I may choose that certain opportunities, may I may not want them on the public site. As we see, the default setting is to not put them on the public calendar. Excuse me, not the public site, public calendar. Um, it's up to you how much you want to push to the public calendar. Um, there's different perspectives on that. The calendar is a nice visual way to look at it, but as you see, it can get very full. Now there is a day view, we default to week, so that helps keep it under control. But as you can see here, I, I'm looking at this personally and I'm just like, I can't make heads or tails of this. There's just too much here. Even if I was switching to a day view, um, it's still pretty, I must not have anything today. It's still going to be pretty can, chock full. Can you? Can we set up so the default is, uh, for example, like not doesn't include the ongoing stuff on the calendar? Not at this time. Okay. Yeah. This is some. The calendar has been going under a lot of scrutiny lately, so um, it, you know that could be reviewed. Um, as a general comment, if you ever have any. Um, questions or even ideas for modifications or feature requests, as they're called, um, you can always email support at funly.com with your feature requests and we can review them. So, so if that has become a problem for you, you know, always let us know. I do believe that, I, I remember hearing something that this, this, a lot of this, and this is just generally being under review right now, so we're always open to ideas though. Okay, uh, but good question though. All right, so the last uh, last setting on this page I do want to just mention is we do have a integration with a third party called Verified Volunteers. So if you go to verifiedvolunteers.com, you can sign up for an account with them. And what this does, it basically runs background checks for your volunteers. So We, we have an account with them already. Oh, groovy. So what you could do is um, fill in the information for Verified Volunteers. And from the system, you can push the volunteers to that service and start the verification process. And then you'll know the results of the verification process in here. So kind of unify those two systems into one. Mm -hmm. So that may be very a good. very handy feature for you then. You may have noticed from a couple of the drop downs uh, for like the volunteers themselves, there was the option to push them to be uh, verified. And when yeah. we go to the pending process, uh, we'll also see it there. I think my demo system actually has it turned on, so uh, we should be actually be able to example it on our next training. So actually, let's okay. make a well. I think it's my EKS one has one, so we'll keep it off for now on this one. And that's requirements. Um, any questions on this page? It's kind of a hefty page. Nope. All righty. <laughs> so the last step for a basic opportunity, and this would also be the last step for an advanced opportunity, is see even next publishing it. Now, for you, publishing is very simple. What you'll do is you'll just pick the day it's going to be published and publish on site. You're done. And you can share it to Facebook and all that fun stuff. For your partners, their, sharing pro their publishing process will be a little different. So this is one place where it's not the same for you. Instead of just the date and publish, because they don't have their own public portal, what they will see is the name of your organization. They'll check that they want to publish to you, and they'll click a publish unpublish button down in the right bottom corner. If they don't do that, it will not be pushed to your public site. So this is, comes up commonly where they're like, hey, I made the opportunity. Why isn't it on your site? What you'll need to do is have them double check that uh, one, their schedules haven't lapsed. And two, they actually have published it. So they've checked your organization and hit publish. So. Gotcha. Yeah, it, if we need to, we can look at a, we'll look at, uh, in the next thing, we can look at some, uh, uh, an organization account real quickly, and we can see that if we want to. Um, but it's not too dissimilar, it just needs to be aware, you need to just need to be aware that it is different. Alrighty, uh, okay, 
So our next, so any, actually any questions about any of that before we talk about advanced opportunities? No. Nope. Okay. All right. So our opportunities. This is going to be the last topic for the day. And um, what this is for is for your more advanced opportunities that we talked about with more complex scheduling. So let's just go ahead and edit an existing one. And we'll notice that the first page is a little different from basic. Uh, the two main differences are one, we have multiple locations now. So here mm -hmm. my tax preparation is done at two different sites. And we no longer do scheduling on this page. So those are the main differences because scheduling is now its own tab. Requirements and publish are exactly the same. So here I also created multiple positions. So if we go to our scheduling tab, we'll find that we now have a more robust scheduling uh, apparatus. I just felt like using that word, it's a fun word. Uh, we still have the options for one time and ongoing, but now we have weekly, monthly, and other. So what we do here is we pick a location and we say what the schedule is for that location. And the schedule is basically when is that location open? What day is the week? We're not worrying about times yet, that's shifts. But, you know, basically, what days is the store open? So for a store, that's usually Monday through Sunday. Um, what days is the office open? Monday through Friday. Um, you know, what days do we do tax help? Mondays and Tuesdays only. Stuff like that. So what we would do is say, okay, it's a one-time or ongoing. So it's kind of more nebulous. Or maybe it's weekly. This is the most common one. So we might say, from this date to this date, every Tuesday and Wednesday, our location will be doing tax preparation. Or we could do, it's always the first Tuesday of the month or some combination therein. Uh, monthly is for specific days of the month. I don't see this used too often. Most things are tend to be weekly. Um, I've also got an other option. So this is for erratic schedules. So we're doing Tuesday this week, then Wednesday next week, then we're gonna skip two weeks and then do a Thursday, Friday combo or I'm gonna do two sessions in one day or something weird like that. that that'd be more of a shift thing. Um, that would be more of it. That would be a shift thing. You would do that with shifts, excuse me. Um, don't see this one used too often, but I have seen this used when opportunities happen, have to happen for a, at a certain time of the day, but are for, for example, determined by the tide. So the opportunity is always at two o'clock, but it requires that it be at two o'clock when it's high tide. So at an organization that they did that, um, uh, uh, environmental organization, or low tide or whatever. So that's where you might use the other option for more erratic schedules. So what you do is say, okay, well, the William Hartnell building does its tax preparation on the first Tuesday of every month and the second Wednesday. It's kind of a weird schedule, but you can go with it. And then you hit save the schedule would be added here to the right and you would be added, so let's just use one of my existing ones, you'll be asked to add a shift. And the shift represents when do people actually show up. So if we use like a retail store for an example, it might be open Monday through Friday um, and we have different shifts when people show up. So you could be very granular, very piece by piece and do Monday morning, Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon. And that would allow volunteers to sign up for each, you know, whatever day, specific day they're interested in. Or you could set it up for weekday morning and weekday afternoon, in which case someone's basically um, pledging themselves to be there every Monday through Friday in the morning, every Monday through Friday in the afternoon. Shifts can be anything you need them to be. They can be short, they can be long, they can overlap with each other. You can leave gaps if you need to. So I could have, you know, you know, the schedule is every Monday through Friday, but for some reason I have no shift for Wednesday. I don't know why you do that, but you could do it. Um, as well as with a shift, you can say that I only need certain positions. So maybe the Monday morning shift only needs greeters and tax helpers. We don't do interpretation or interpretator, uh, if you have my type of spelling, um, for Monday mornings. So we can get very... Um, intricate with our sh schedules and shifts for an advanced opportunity if we want to. Most of the time people don't, but I've seen, for example, the EKS program, they get a little on the intricate side. 
So any questions about advanced scheduling? Nope. Okay. I don't think so. <laughs> what was that? I said I don't think so. All righty. <laughs> um, well, since I am recording this, you will have this available to you. I do have a couple examples here. So for example, SoCo Nexus is every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, not Sundays. And we have a weekday morning and a Saturday morning shift, as, or opposed to Willem Hartnell, which actually it does each day individually, although I only ever did the two. So, all right. That, let's see, is there anything else we're scheduling? We need to, oh, date exceptions, almost forgot. There, when you're using things like weekly, you may know that you know it's every Thursday, but what about Thanksgiving? We don't have people come on Thanksgiving or the day after. So you can put date exceptions. So it might be every Thursday except for this Thursday, or it's every Monday except for this Monday because it's Memorial Day, um, and so on and so forth. So keep in mind your date exceptions. One thing I do want to mention while before we complete for the day is the time frames you work in. It's very important. Um, some opportunities are very clear with their time, time frames. One time, it's just a day. Can't get into too much trouble there. <laughs> um, other times, it's things that are kind of open-ended. So, for example, um, office helpers, you know, people who come into your office, like or interns, for example, and um, or just any sort of long-term volunteer. A lot of organizations are tempted to make one opportunity that spans a large time frame, so 2015 through 2020. And sometimes that works fine. You know, if you don't tend to have a lot of interns and they tend to actually stick around for that long a time, you could be okay. However, when you have an opportunity with a lot of turnaround or very complicated scheduling, um, basically a lot of turnaround in the end, uh, that could become problematic. Because if my opportunity spans five years and I go through 20, 20 relatively unique volunteers a week, you know, 20 times 52 times five, you know, that I think takes us into the thousand range, right? No, maybe not quite. It's in the hundreds. Uh, I can't do math. <laughs> So, as you can see, that you could think that number of volunteers in one list, where most of the volunteers are probably outdated, can be very hard to manage. So what I usually recommend, given you know the various circumstances of the opportunity, is when you create an opportunity and you do the schedules for the opportunity, so your date range is here basically, and the name in for the opportunity, break it into into more discrete pieces than something that's you know some some large time period. I recommend doing it in uh, monthly, quarterly, or yearly segments. So it would be our internship program, March. Internship program, quarter one, 2016. Internship, internship program, 2016. And then at the end of 2016, at the end of the quarter, at the end of the month, you'll create a new opportunity for the next segment where the volunteers will reapply and that will all give, you know, there's a couple reasons for this. So they're reapplying. If they've already filled out all their forms and stuff and you're using the same forms and you're using the same orientations, the system knows this and kind of skips them ahead. So it's already done and all you're doing is reaffirming them, getting a fresh list, and you know what's current. If you've made changes to your volunteer form, this gives you the opportunity to recapture information, to have them update their information to get the new information. Or if a new orientation is required, they reorient or reorientate if you're British because I think that's the word they use. Um, so I, it's part of the, those are the, the reasons I recommend breaking it into discrete sections like month, quarter, year. Example. Oh. Eric, let me ask. So yeah. when you have an opportunity that say, say you do it annually, so I create something today and it's good until this date, mm -hmm. uh, 2017. So when I sign up mm -hmm. in, or when a volunteer signs up in September mm -hmm. for that opportunity, did they, does the system recognize that it's September when they came to me, or does it default back to today, the day that I set it up? Gotcha. It sense? will know that they signed up in September. However, the it they'll it won't it won't be a rolling year for them. 
so they wouldn't reapply in September, they'd reapply. So for example, my EKS, they'd reapply at the beginning of the year. Gotcha. Or whatever. whatever or whatever. Yeah. You know, you might do it the school year okay. or, or something different. But okay. so okay. It, the, the exact date that they'd have to reapply or that the opportunity starts is hard coded. But the system will know that, you know, on their applet that their application came in on X date. And reports right. can be run on that and what have you. No, good question. Right. Okay. Um, so I'll skip my example. It was a Habitat for Humanity. They do it by month because they do a lot of volunteers when they work on houses. But so I guess I didn't skip the example. But um, that's everything I had for today's training. Okay. Any, any questions about anything we covered today? And then we we'll do a little wrap up, just a little bookkeeping. Uh, no, not important. Okay. To you. Cool. So give no, me one. I got lots of notes. <laughs> 